Hello everyone! Hello. Hey, how is everybody doing? First day of ApacheCon. Alright. Well, it's time to do Shark Tank. Uh, which is basically our way of introducing a whole bunch of bottlings and subjecting them to the wrath of the panel. Which I'm about to introduce. So first on the panel is Sally. Sally, stand up and sit on one of those chairs. <laughs> Unfortunately, unfortunately, we have a little bit of an issue with AV, so I will let the panel members introduce themselves, but once I'm done, sort of like calling them out. So Jim is the next one on the panel. Jim, stand up and get on the panel. And last but not least, Justin. And we will start with small introduction from every single one of them. I am Sally Kadiri. I am the Vice President of Marketing Publicity at the Apache Software Foundation. I know a lot of podlings. Who has graduated? Top level projects. Okay, hello. So we've worked together and uh, whomever is coming up, watch out. Uh, Jim Jagelski, uh, gray beard curmudgeon, uh, lots of historical knowledge of absolutely no worth whatsoever. <laughs> Hi, Justin McLean. Um, I tend to hang out on the incubator list where I've uh, reviewed a couple of releases. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we have four exciting podlings for you to judge today, so be gentle on them. Uh, but if you spot anybody who is not worthy of Apache Incubator, just let them know. I mean, because that's what they're here for. And with that, w I will explain just a few rules. Uh, so each podling gets exactly 10 minutes. Uh, I will be showing one of these. Um, five minutes left, one minute left, stop. And this is not one of those, you know, fluffy talks where you get to go. When I say stop, you stop because we have a lot of you to go through. And then panel gets five minutes to ask any kind of questions they feel are interesting, necessary, useful, or just entertaining. Uh, you have to answer all of them, uh, and you have to convince uh, them and the rest of us that you are worthy. So with that, let's go with Apache Minute, our first uh, podling on the stand. So Aditi, please. Uh, Aditi. I don't think it's working. No, it, it isn't for the room, but it is for the recording. So that's. Ah. The <laughs> <laughs> like I said, we have an issue with AV. So. Well, I hope I have a loud enough voice. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Aditi Hilbert. I'm a product manager at Runtime, and uh, we uh, come up with solutions to manage devices. Um, remotely, and these devices are small devices. These are 32-bit microcontroller devices. So nothing that can run Linux or Linux-like operating systems. So what we uh, contribute heavily into is the Apache Minute project, and that's what I'm very excited about and here to talk about it. Oh, where's the? Just So Apache Minute is an open source operating system for these 32-bit microcontrollers. It is a full-fledged operating system. So there is a kernel, real-time operating system kernel, that is preemptive, multi-threaded, you know, has the scheduler and everything. But it also has a lot of middleware and utilities that brings the Linux-like utilities that we love so much, functionality that, um, to uh, these small devices. So what do I mean by this middle middleware? I mean things like secure bootloader, something that can verify the image that is running on your small devices. And by small devices, I mean things like wearables, uh, smart jewelry, you know, um, maybe some industrial IoT devices, monitoring some power somewhere, power line. Um, so uh, there is the secure bootloader that can verify the image that is running on these devices. There are different ha hardware abstraction layers that make it easy for the application developers to write applications without worrying about all the underlying hardware details. Uh, there is stats, logging, that you can collect remotely, and that's what device management people love. So we want to see how, the, how is the uh, device functioning, because otherwise the data, you cannot trust the data that you're getting from these uh, devices. You have... Um, Configuration options, because you want to th make change things while they're working in the network. And um, doing field once you have field de deployments, sending people out there is very expensive. So you want to be able to remotely manage all these things. 
So of course, to do all these things remotely, you need network connectivity. And so we provide open source network stacks. We started with Bluetooth um, stack. We started with Bluetooth stack. And um, we are also now um, investing in LoRa and 802.15.4G mesh. We also already have IPv4 and IPv6 support. So there's a choice of network protocols for you. So the Minute project comes with not just the operating system, but also a very cool build and package management tool. And that is called Newt. So we have a family of uh, Newts, basically. Uh, so that's called Newt tool. And it is a very clever uh, build and package management tool. It brings sanity and organization to um, your project when you are, especially when you're collaborating and managing large data uh, code bases, because it allows you to have components, mix and match them, optimize them, test them as separate modules. And then when you want to have the hardware in front of you, which is called the target, you want to build an image that is exactly right for that target, the Newt can smartly build all these different attach, you know, combine, stitch together these different uh, components and build you the image that you want. And that will enable the application that you want. So um, of course, it helps you debug and it helps you transition from your prototype to manufacturing. Because the new tool can do, for example, create images. So images that are signed, images that have manufacturing information. Because you want, after 20 years, you want to find out, oh, what was the default image that came with it? And when was it built? You know, what did it have? What package did, packages did it have? So it has all that information. And Newt can keep track and build all that into a manufacturing image. And then finally, because Newt is smart and can keep track of all these dependencies between packages and can allows you to version all the packages, um, it actually enables collaboration. Um, and you can work in different repositories, and then you can release, test and release them, and then connect to them as you need. So think of them as connecting all these libraries while working on them, sep on them separately. And Newt is the intelligent tool that helps you do that. So we are not done yet. We are, there's something else. There is Newt Manager. That's the device management protocol that is also part of the Newt Manager, um, um, my Newt project. And that is an application protocol that allows you to remotely connect to the device and configure or do these operations on the device. Um, <clears throat> the basic implementation was in Go, and, um, but we have had contributors in the community who uh, one of them actually implemented it in JavaScript and has a runtime Node.js uh, for it. So tomorrow, uh, yes, so you can actually upgrade a device um, over BLE using um, from your browser, for example. Okay. And that's powerful. So um, again, we try to incorporate as many um, implementations, and we want to offer choices to the product manufacturer. So besides Newt Manager, you could also go, say, for something, a standard app uh, protocol such as re a RESTful core uh, constrained um, format, uh, constrained RESTful environment. Or you could just go for co-app, okay, essentially where the device advertises or announces publishes the URI for all the resources that, that, is ha that it has. So for example, if it's a light resource or if it's a sensor, it can um, have a URI for that particular sensor. And then a uh, uh, backend service can discover that URI, can query the device, can collect data, delete, basically manage the device. So, um, bas uh, so these are the different options that you have for device management. Um, I also wanted to highlight some of the community contributions that we have had. And it kind of shows you the range of things that are possible in this project. So we have, uh, we are hardware agnostic, this operating system. So we, although we work with Cortex-M, ARM Cortex-M um, architecture, we support MIPS architecture, we are also going to support RISC five architecture. So somebody in the community has already done a MIPS port, for example. 
you know, the PIC32, Microchip PIC32 board is supported. Bluetooth 5. So we, I talked about a Bluetooth stack. We started with Bluetooth BLE 4.2. Now we have BLE 5 support. People worked on a sensor framework to make life easier. If you want to integrate some standard sensors, temperature sensor, accelerometer, or you know, a humidity sensor, then it is easy to plug in new sensors and uh, plug in the drivers because there is a hardware abstraction layer. And so writing applications that actually configure and collect data from these sensors is much easier, okay? People also worked on console and shell improvements. Uh, somebody added an I2C protocol. Uh, that's, you know, how you connect on the board hardware. You can have a serial connection, SPI connection. Somebody added an I2C pro protocol. And as I said, mentioned before, somebody wrote, wrote Newt Manager in Node.js. So uh, we have had different kinds of contributions, and we are hoping for more and more. And this, so at ApacheCon, I'm here to um, pitch this project and uh, hope to generate some interest and networking and collaboration. It's just uh, some interesting use cases that people have put uh, Minute to, um, used Minute for. The first one that we, I became aware of was a Quack slider. And that was, I think, used more than a year back. And there's a picture of that. It's a little duck, which is basically a conference badge, as well as a clicker to advance slides. And this was used at a security conference. And then um, people optimized the code and uh, put it into really small footprint, 128 kilobytes, a whole OS with Bluetooth stack, as well as a management protocol, 128 kilobytes. Um, some BLE peripheral, you know, connections of many types, concur many concurrent connections, and so on. And then finally, I just wanted to highlight that there was, has been a lot of activity in this project, and we have 20 committers, different affiliations with different companies, uh, 39 contributors so far, and um, over 5,000 commits. Just, uh, just earlier today, somebody, um, tra the traffic control PS folks, they um, uh, uh, said that they uh, alerted me that we were 13th, number 13th, in the number of commits uh, so far. So yeah. So we are doing great as far as activity is concerned. And we have a lot of forks and lots of stars and likes. And email activity, lots of discussion. And uh, we have really focused on putting ideas forth and discussing how, you know, and people come up with proposals. And there's a lot of healthy. Um, community discussion, I think. And then we created lots of tickets, we've addressed most of them, and so we are going full steam ahead. And that is, the time's up, and my talk's up too. All so, right. thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, don't go, I didn't, don't go anywhere yet, not just yet. That was a great pitch. As far as I'm concerned, the project is ready to graduate, but what do the judges think? <laughs> See, I was right about the curmudgeon part, and gives it to me first. Um, okay, assuming I know nothing at all about real-time operating systems, what is it about Newt that makes it so special? I mean, you told me a lot about what it is, but okay, what's what what makes it different from other options out there? Why should I uh, spend my uh, my contributor talents on my Newt rather than something else? Sure, there are other operating systems out there, but this is the one with the most permissive license, so thank you, ASF. And, um, so that's one reason. And then uh, the other reason is that uh, we actually have thought about the commercial aspects, meaning that this OS is meant to be in production. Okay, so it's not just a development OS, not like free RTOS, which, you know, um, so or some other RTOSs that are out there which are more academic in nature. So this is meant to um, actually um, enable product manufacturers to not spend upfront and yet build a product that can be taken to market. So, um, and as you, you heard a lot about device management as well, so we are thinking long term and making sure that this manage, uh, the device that is built on this operating system is actually something that will be successful and will able, be able to function long term 
in an actual deployment. So. It seems like Sally has a question. All right. <laughs> Okay, as the resident non-technologist, I'm going to ask questions that may seem odd, but I'm curious. Tell me about the security regarding this. If, if anyone can use it, well, what's going on with security-wise? Oh. Yeah, you probably do. All right, sorry. Maybe we can actually put you yeah, right here. Yeah, maybe let's stand yeah, here. So you yes. can, okay. So yes. So security-wise, we are building in security um, in all the different components that constitute Minute. So you heard me talk about the secure bootloader. That is basically making sure that a firmware that is authorized and authenticated uh, it boots up the device. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is when we are talking about um, communicating with the device, you want to make sure that the communication channels are protected. So we have implemented all the standard protocols. So for example, you know, uh, if we have UDP protocol, we have DTLS, support for DTLS. TLS for IP connections. Uh, BLE comes with security. We have made sure that that is not optional. That is mandatory. So we support all the security profiles and you know, uh, security ma manager in Bluetooth. So, um, so protocol-wise also we are covered. And then as far as the code is concerned, um, we are also you know, doing regular checks. I mean, and one of the good things about open source is there are so many eyes on it. And people are looking at it. So security-wise, that's one of the better options that is out there. And um, so um, we also, so for example, we run coverity scans. And we are running um, you know, vulnerability checks uh, regularly to make sure that the code quality is good. So we are um, taking steps to make sure that security is very much a part of the project. Another question that comes up a lot, especially when you're ready to graduate, is who uses you? So are there, I, I see some use cases, but are there actually organizations that use you? Yes, there are organizations that use us. Without name, ma naming any particular orga uh, organization, I can say that there are um, things like lock manufacturers, for example, presence detect detectors, you know, in a conference room, how many people are there. Uh, there are athletic wear, you know, where they monitor your different um, heart rate and um, other characteristics. Um, there are um, rehabilitation services that actually monitor how you are uh, moving. Um, then what else? So yes, there are several. I could go on. Do you so want more? Production in these organizations? So in these productions, um, yes. Some of them are in um, production. Okay. And some of them are being tested. We've got one more question from Kirsten. We've got about that much time. And then a voting thoughts. I'll keep it short. Why haven't you graduated yet? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> we, a um, couple of things, I think we took our, um, we took time to understand the governance and make sure that multiple people knew it in the community, not just one person. And so we, so for example, when we did our uh, releases, we took turns in doing the releases and going through the licenses because we don't want to just depend on one or two people. So that takes time, and, but I think that is time well spent. So that's one reason. And then the second is um, we are trying to document each and everything that we do, including all the maturity and um, the steps that we have taken. And um, yes, so that is taking a li little time, but I think, again, um, that will help uh, us in the future as well. So we are ready to graduate. I think we, are, we want to uh, send out the re resolution charter, and I think this week or next week, so. So, one quick bit of advice from every single one of you, or thoughts, or anything that you would like to tell the following, just a few sentences, you know, from every single judge. Start with Justin. All right. <laughs> um. Ship it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, keep up the good work. Sometimes after graduation, podlings get um, uh, lackadaisical and lazy. Keep as much effort going uh, forward. And keep attracting new committers. Your presentation was great, so make sure there's more people in your community that can do that too. Thank you. Awesome. Once again, thank you so much. Thank you. And next stop is Will. Will will be telling us about EdgeNet. Yes. So take it away. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Uh, hi everyone, my name is Will Marshall. I am a committer and contributor to Apache Agent. Um, Apache Agent has been incubating at the uh, uh, Apache Software Foundation for the last year, but the name was changed from Quarks about eight months ago. For, so uh, for those who knew it as Quarks, it is uh, now Agent. Um, the, uh, to explain Agent, I, I think it might first help to talk a little bit about data streaming. So. Um, Data streaming, I find, is best described as the way data is consumed from sources that might run forever. For example, a uh, connected temperature sensor, which produces temperature readings. Um, you can't wait until you have all of the readings to process them, um, since you know, it might never turn off. So the uh, data needs to be processed as soon as it is ingested into the system. And any application which is processing data needs to be written with that principle in mind. And so uh, there needs to be a framework which is also created with um, that principle in mind. Um, uh, the way that this is solved uh, nowadays with a number of different streaming technologies is that let's say you have um, some sensors at the edge. If you have uh, the GPS device on a phone or if you have a temperature sensor, like I said, um, something measuring the temperature of the uh, fluid intake of your car's engine or the humidity of your house. You could have many, many different sensors. This is uh, a common pattern that we see. Typically, the data is sent to a cluster where it is analyzed by a system, for example, Spark or um, Flink or any, any number of different data processing systems. And um, the issue with this is that this could potentially be a lot of data, and this is problematic for two reasons. One, a lot of uh, edge devices, uh, external systems, use 3G or 4G network connectivity to communicate their data, and you are paying for every kilobyte that you send, and this can be very expensive. Uh, additionally, um, uh, yeah, y there, there might be uh, bandwidth caps in addition to that. There are also latency issues. If the backend system determines that some action needs to be taken, then the action has round trip latency associated with it, which might prove to be too much for some applications. And the takeaway from this is that we need to send less information from edge devices. We need to make sure that only interesting data is sent. So uh, back to the example of temperature of an engine, if you know that the standard operating temperature is between um, 50 and 70 degrees Celsius, then uh, maybe your application doesn't need to send those values. It's only when it starts to go above uh, that range that you want to start monitoring that more closely from the back end. And as such, this kind of these streaming operations um, that process data on the edge, they need to happen um, on the device, and so to, to perform data reduction. <clears throat> so this is exactly what the problem that Agent is solving. It is, it is doing streaming analytics at the edge, and Agent is a community to um, uh, 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 promote that. Uh, it is written in Java, and we chose Java because it struck a good balance between um, how quickly we could uh, you know, get something out into the hands of the developers, but uh, and and the actual performance of, of the system. But additionally, because it runs on a JVM, any system which runs in a, a JVM can also likely support Agent. For example, uh, Android phones, Raspberry Pis, uh, things things of that nature. Uh, Agent is um, modular in the sense that uh, its core runtime and the features uh, that it it has are is composed by a number of different jar files. And if you are using MQTT to communicate to your backend from a phone or uh, other device, you might not need a Kafka connector, which is uh, um, you know, using up extra space. And so for um, devices which are constrained, especially this might be very beneficial. The runtime is also extensible in the sense that while we were writing it, we had in mind the thought that uh, someone might come along and say this is great, but it doesn't quite suit our needs. And so we, we tried to make it easy for another developer to come along and uh, improve upon it and extend our interfaces, um, hopefully uh, relatively easily. Um, oh, just to back up for a sec, we, uh, for Java, we chose Java, but ultimately the decision for what language to choose should come from the community because um, 
uh, it's possible that there should be a different language which should be prioritized. Um, so here are a few applications. Um, the first two are uh, ones which have actually been written. So monitoring remote temperature sensors. Um, if you were at our earlier talk today, you would have seen a face detection um, application which only sent frames to a back end if it detected faces in, in the image, which drastically reduced the amount of data which was sent. Uh, listening to a microphone and only sending the sound intervals which contain somebody speaking uh, if, if the decibel level is high enough. So these are the types of applications which uh, might play well with our framework, with, with Edgent. Uh, so we've been incubating for about a year, and there are many things that have gone well for our, uh, our community. One is that we do have a, a fair amount of functionality. The runtime is well tested. We, we've put emphasis on that. and. Um, is relatively mature for how uh, young it is, in um, uh, my opinion. And uh, we have a good release cadence. We released uh, the, the first version, which was made public about a, a year ago. Um, four months ago, we, we released another version. And about two months ago, we had yet another version. So we are continuing to release and uh, provide uh, improvements to Edgent. And lastly, we're, we're taking big steps to integrate with other frameworks. It's very important that Edgent is easy to integrate with whatever system uh, needs to communicate with an Edge device. And this can be databases, Kafka, MQT, I've mentioned those, but also like REST and WebSockets. And there, there's so many ways of talking to, to applications on the Edge. Um, and uh, cons might be a little hard. I might say uh, ways of improving, um, but we need more contributors. Um, uh, we need to garner more interest. We've focused a lot on the actual tech, but not necessarily on publicity, and that, that is something that um, needs, needs to be focused on. And also diversity among committers. Right now there are uh, eight committers, and uh, seven of them work for IBM. Uh, so uh, focusing on, on that aspect as well, but hopefully that should come along with uh, publicity and, and getting more community interest. But in general, I think uh, Agent is very well positioned. Uh, Internet of Things is something which gathers interest right now, and I, I um, see a lot of applications for it. So hopefully this served as a good introduction to Agent, our community, and uh, I'll take it away, judges. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. So another exciting IoT project, another great pitch, but what do the judges think? Hey, well, so uh, IoT is hot and sexy and everyone's talking about it and that's fantastic and great presentation. Why so few committers? Um, like I mentioned, we focus more on the actual implement, uh, sorry, implementation of uh, the releases and, and getting the functionality out there. and. Um, haven't done as much marketing or outreach as much as we could. We're, we're starting doing uh, meetups in places like San Francisco and um, uh, Boston, and hopefully that, that will get some more interest. Uh, that's really the biggest problem that, that we see right now, so that's uh, also part of why I'm here. <laughs> Um, uh, your initial design driver was, uh, if I understood correctly, basically that uh, communication is, is expensive and, or slow or the combination of both. If history is shown as anything, uh, that usually is a problem that doesn't last for a long period of time. So I'm wondering, um, do you have a, uh, a second option or a pivot considering that if those restrictions which you're really, really focused on the design driver behind it um, are no longer restrictions anymore. Um, sure. So there, there are. Um, oh, thanks. Um, I mentioned that there were two main draws to Edgent. One of them is data reduction, and the other one uh, is if you have a streaming service running on the device, then you don't incur round trip latency going to a back end. And so um, while you wouldn't use this for like a control system and like a car, uh, for certain applications, um, you might want to write it in Java and just not have to uh, worry about you know 200 millisecond round, round trips. So that, that's like one aspect of it that's sort of a technical thing. But I, I, I guess other than that, um, uh, this was sort of brought up earlier today. Um, uh, if, if you imagine just you have um, 
streaming applications running on a lot of edge devices. Um, and we have a publish subscribe network between them. Um, uh, um, yeah, I actually don't know where I'm going with that, but uh, okay. I, I would say the first answer. Yeah, yeah. Are you thinking like a multiplexing kind of implementation or, or whatever? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So do you think you might be able to attract more committers if you uh, targeted more constrained devices rather than just, just working on the JVM? So to target more constrained devices, it would be likely that we'd have to re-implement Edgin in something which is not Java, um, which is something that we have talked about. Um, but uh, like I said, that decision is something that ideally would come from the community. We want, before we uh, take the time to completely re-implement it in a different language, we want someone to uh, point at an application and say, hey, this is really cool, um, but it would be better if it were in Swift um, or Go or, or something else. And um, so I think part of that comes from having a larger discussion about it. And um, from that might come oh, yes, actually, we want this to run on a microprocessor. We need it to be at a lower level. And um, uh, that would be a great discussion. <laughs> yeah. One more question. Oh, yeah. Who uses you? Are you deployed in real life anywhere? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, yeah. so any burning thoughts? <laughs> so we, we did have uh, one case where it was used. There was a, a festival in Germany, um, and people had little ARFID chips uh, in their badges, I think. And uh, every room, every like place in the festival had a, a, like, a sensor, so you could sort of track where people were going in real time. Um, I didn't work on that application myself, but uh, that was an actual application. But we haven't heard from them since, and so I guess it went well. Uh, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, just keep up the good work and you're, you're getting there, I think. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think uh, I, I'm also with, uh, with Sally. I don't understand why you're not pulling in more people because it really is an incredibly cool project. Um, uh, the, the space itself is, is very, very interesting, but also just the technology behind it is the kind of stuff that people really, really like playing around with. So uh, take advantage of whatever opportunities the ASF has to uh, promote the project, because um, it, it's, it, I have a feeling it's going to be like a, a dam break, and all of a sudden you're going to have a crowd of people coming in. What Jim said. <laughs> Amazing, we're right on time. This is amazing. So next up is uh, Open Whisk. So yeah. Thank you. Um, this is my first time in uh, ApacheCon, and I was I might not want to give my presentation now. That I've seen those two. Um, my my frame of reference was a YouTube video with a horse. So um, I thought this was a different type of presentation. Um, my, my should be quick. Uh, my name is Carlos Santana. No guitar jokes. <laughs> I don't play the guitar. I only have 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Open Whisk. Um, if I, I, we don't cover something here, uh, uh, we have two talks on Thursday, so if you can, you can learn more about that. Um, Open Whisk is a serverless uh, platform um, that you can run serverless, also known as function as a service or event driven. Uh, programming language or programming uh, model, and um, anyone uh, also uh, competitors, also known as Amazon Lambda, um, does kind of rewrite functions. But uh, let's get to the meat of it to convince these three uh, people that um, we are awesome. Um, anyway, uh, with OpenWhisk, since we are serverless, we use less energy, right? So that's how we're going to save the planet. My pitch today is like, if you go OpenWhisk, you go green. We go green, we save the planet. Um, less idle servers, right? With less, less energy wasted. So the, the, the trick with OpenWhisk as a implementation of a, this multi-tenant is to get as many functions as possible running concurrently on a single VM. Now that you're not in charge of the VM as a, as a programmer, we, the platform owner, are in charge of VMs, and those are not infinite. Hear me again, those are not infinite. Um, 
Um, so the the more we utilize servers, um, fill them with functions. So that the challenge as a committer of your if you're joining Open with is that you think every day it's like how do we can fit more functions into a single VM, right? In an efficient way, in a sandbox way, in a secure way. Um, so my pitch is to to committers in that way. But uh, for programmers that they don't want to deal with infrastructure or localhost 8080 or how many VMs do I need, they just we just tell them write functions, don't no, not servers. Uh, in terms of a programmer, you go back to basics. Uh, basics like a browser. Do you remember your first JavaScript uh, web application? Maybe you started with HTML5 5 for JavaScript, where you handle an event. This is the same paradigm. We go to that simplicity of abstraction in the cloud right now. Handles an event, there's a function behind it. Uh, like I said, functions that handle events. Uh, remember on click? Who doesn't remember on click, right? Um, it's the same thing as the cloud. In the cloud, there's things happening in the like IoT space, uh, mobile applications, backend uh, databases. It's an event, and, and an HTTP request is an event. So you handle it with a function. So the idea of serverless is get with functions. Functions as a service, if you want to go in that term, but in terms of you're dealing with functions. And yes, there will be a lot of functions that you have to manage. So DevOps is not going away. It's getting uh, more fun. Um, I'm doing with time. Um, this is a simple scenario as, as a your committer of the core uh, open with platform um, is your we're concentrating on always maximizing that utilization so we have functions so instead of having functions just idling in there wasting energy not saving the planet um, you get all those functions working together into a, into a single VM so we maximize utilization the idea is um, if you have an application that is, is, is maximizing utilization on a VM, that's okay. Leave it as a non-serverless application, which that's okay. People, you don't have to use the hot thing like right now because everybody's using it, right? But if you may have use cases where you need to maximize that, that VM to use multiple functions. Um, this, is, this is a graph, so every, every, every good <laughs> chart, right, has it's a graph. So this, is, this shows you like uh, as we go forward, uh, the planet gets better, right? Um, uh, things that we can build with serverless, right? Mobile applications, um, message queues with Kafka, those, those are type of events. Uh, web application and HTTP single page app, REST APIs, we can build it with serverless. Um, IoT, we talk about IoT, doing data, uh, data analytics. Um, what else? DB, DB processing. So uh, something that gets inserted into a database, you want to react to it. Maybe you want to run things in parallel. Maybe you have a burst, a burst of data entries into a database and you need to process them. And then past two weeks and nothing happens, you don't pay for it. So that's kind of the benefits also as of serverless is the third one is uh, you pay as you go in terms of um, in open source, you don't pay. But, but if uh, OpenWiz is hosted on a, on a platform, uh, then you pay as you go. Um, talking about mobile applications and while I'm here, I'm looking for investments, right? <laughs> So we're going to build a mobile app, and we're going to put it in the App Store, and we're going to call it Whiskers Save the Planet. And Whiskers is the term that we call ourselves to commuters working in open whisk. Um, whisk is not about cooking, right? Uh, or Whiskers. Um, I have five minutes. Um, so the, the idea is that we're going to build a mobile app. Um, as as any other, other any um, hot app out there, you're going to play a game. So it's going to be a game. You earn points, and your challenge. Uh, will be, you know, will be fun because if you become a committer of OpenWiz, your challenge is how how can I fit more functions concurrently into a single VM? So your challenge is is that game. So we came up with that with that game um, actually last night. Um, <laughs> uh, so so you get points, right? So any any good mobile app, you use points to brag to your friends or buy uh, buy clothes or build rooms or or things like that. Um, you can donate to, to, a, to a foundation to serve um, the earth. Um, I don't know who added that last one. Um, uh, there's a guy you know, in the infra chat room always saying like, hey, infra, keep, uh, stop giving VMs to TL to top level projects, right? They're waste, wasteful. Let's, create, let's take a few VMs and create an open with serverless platform and just give people uh, accounts so they can write functions to build a website, to build, to, to build anything of, of they have. Um, I've, I've, I've been a PMC for Apache Cordova, and I hate to 
I really hate managing my, my VM. I don't like to patch it with kernels. I don't get, I don't like to get that email from Infra saying, hey, you have a security hole. Somebody hacked you last night. Like, okay, okay, again, just give me, give me, give me something where I can put a Node.js or a Go uh, snippet of code that handles a website and just serves a website whenever it uses uses that that application or or DevOps. Like, if we have a, uh, we have to do CI or CD, just just write functions. So that's. That's the idea. So if we can convince Infra, you get bonus points. Uh, my design, so that's what I'm looking for, investment. This is not Tetris at all. This is not Tetris. I didn't, cover, I didn't copy this from Tetris. Um, the, the, the challenge of the game is to well, whisker save the planet. Uh, this, is a, this is a single VM that you need to fit all these functions. We have Java functions, we have JavaScript, we have Python, we have Go, and all of them are running at the same time. Everybody wants to run their functions, and we have to need, need to manage to how, how, to, how can we run all these Docker containers, right? Uh, at the same time while pausing, pausing some and running some others uh, and making it secure. So um, if you, you feel the adrenaline playing this game, you can be an awesome committer in our, on our project because that's what we live every day. Uh, funding. So we do have, you have, we have, I have, I, I, we built two, two ways of funding. So you can give us, I calculated like $5,000 for one day a designer. Uh, because we need a designer and then a one week a developer is it's enough to build a mobile app so develop or 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 beer is, is anyway i the other option which I, I i like better is you can be a contributor to our project so you can start from um using it like any commuter that is it's working on a project is because he's a user first i think that's the thing that i learned first um and then you can you, you can be a contributor a, a, a contributor just helping with the docs or or, or opening an issue uh, I started like that when I, uh, be before I was a PMC in, in Cordova, um, I started just opening issues. I, I was a user and I started opening issues and then the, the community was very welcoming and I started like fixing things and I fixing docs and I helped with the blog until I got into the code and then I, I was the one that opened the Slack and then I answered all, <laughs> answer all the questions. So you, you start small. So um, yeah, uh, contribution is, is one way. You want to give us funding? That's okay. Also, we, we need a designer. Um, I'm, I'm not very good in designers. And um, and go uh, back to the incubating. So uh, open with is incubating. We just started. I hear people uh, many months. Uh, December, I think November, December. We we did the proposal. Uh, Adobe and IBM are mostly the committers. Um, um, we open a. We have our mailing list. So we have been doing our uh, infra duties, right? Um, Getting our, our uh, website up, um, getting the PMC, uh, voting some committers. Um, what else? I've been working with Infra to move our 28 GitHub repositories to Gitbox. Um, I'm growing. Uh, we'll be talking yesterday, uh, tomorrow, uh, Thursday about that. Um, in terms of community, I, I think I put a, a green dot there. I think it's more a yellow. Uh, what we're missing for, for graduating is attracting uh, independent committers or other companies um, to to help. So I think that's where we're missing missing. And the other stuff is um, start doing releases and getting that cadence and automation. We're we're uh, big about automation. So I heard somebody like um, documenting the process. I I prefer to document it with with code. So anyone can do a release, any and and get into that cadence of what does it mean to do it in an Apache way. I think uh, folks that are doing Apache know what that means, folks that are not, uh, you just need to be help and we um, uh, be one team. I think that's, that's, that's tough. So I, don't, I think that's it. Thank you so much, that was awesome. <laughs> that and, and I don't know about the rest of you, but if you need anybody on the IPMC to ever review your releases, you just got the guy. <laughs> it was, that was awesome. But back to judges. Start with Jim. Hmm? Start with Jim. Okay. So I've got a, a great idea that what we do is we remove containers, we remove VMs, and instead we write everything as one large monolithic program on a single server. That would seem to alleviate all the kind of problems that OpenWhisk is trying to solve. How would you respond to someone with that sort of backward thinking mentality? Um, I think if you have, have one server and one VM and that VM is big enough to serve all your users and all the data that comes in 
um, that's a good choice. If the opposite, you have a lot of data that comes in and you don't know when, and you don't have a, a big of a server um, or a budget or the complexity and the learning of, of doing DevOps, maybe OpenWiz is a, is a starting point. Uh, great presentation, by the way. Uh, I, I certainly like the uh, game that's not Tetris. <laughs> um, I, I was just thinking along Jim's lines, uh, if you're just writing applications at a whole series of functions, how do you make something that's more complex than just a whole lot of separate functions? How do you modulize it? How do you put it all together? Is there is any, any features inside? Yeah. Um, so that's that's why we decided to to take it into op it's been in GitHub in uh, four years. So that's that's, some, that's not open source, right? Everybody knows that. <laughs> uh, that's just source open, I guess, right? Um, but in, in uh, that's why we're building it in the open source community to get feedback from the users. And right now, what OpenWiz has is uh, I would say the the uh, a basic programming model where you can. Uh, declare a sequence. So you can create a sequence of actions um, and you don't you don't get penalized for the things uh, the think time. So you can stitch together a chain of actions, but we're working on to see if we can create kind of a, a step function type of uh, programming model where we can create a DSL so you can build that that application. But uh, on the flip side, since we're talking about monoliths, you're going to microservices, this is more nano services. So what happens when you have a lot of things to, that are doing stuff and you don't know where they are and when, if they work or didn't work, it comes monitoring and logging. So uh, you're not getting away from that. So we're trying to build things that, um, you, we have a programming model where you have triggers and rules. So you can define triggers and rules what on the actions and those actions can be sequences. But as you can see, it gets, it gets kinda, kinda complex. So we want, we want to build it with the community so the community can come with the answers and build a solution together as we try things and build things. And that's why we're kind of early in the process of, of, of this project. Okay, so you had a fun presentation. Um, it's exciting and again, we like the games and all of that's great. And you mentioned simplicity and I think a lot of people agree that simple, elegant design is definitely the way to go. Um, how are you finding the project uh, in terms of attraction? Users, uh, I know there's some media about it, but that's not an Apache thing. And since we're very closely associated for a lot of people psychologically with servers, um, are people understanding your concept easily and are, are they able to gravitate towards it? And what, what's happening in terms of how people are being able to use it? Yeah, so, so I think we are getting good, good attraction of um, developers building apps, simple apps, write a function, it runs, write a trigger, it runs. Uh, where we're missing attractions is committers. Um, part of the systems are kind of complex. Um, actually, they're complex because they're solving uh, hard problems. Uh, we're using a lot of components. We, this, uh, we have Docker, we have Kafka, uh, we have uh, Scala system with uh, AKK, things that may not be familiar to a lot of people to be, you know, contributing and helping with the source code. What we're seeing is an adoption of users that are starting to use it, understand pieces, helping other users answering questions. So in that respect, we see that, that, but how do we turn that around and turn those users into committers? Like I was saying, every committer starts as a user. So we need to provide more like documentation or steps on how to do your first PR, how to test it, how to set up your environment. Um, because right now it's optimized for people like Adobe and, and, and IBM that are deploying this in, my, in, my scale, in, in, in a scale, multi-tenants, uh, enterprise ready, but not commuter ready, I would say. Yep. How many right, commuters so do you have? Uh, we have around 15 commuters PMC, more than 15. Um, but mo most of our are them at IBM, so we're trying to attract people that are independent, um, that, can, that can sustain this, and also we're in production, uh, so we have a best, best interest, but that's not the Apache way. Right? Uh, well I want to see the project that if, if one of the big companies leave the project, that project consistent goes forward um, as a community. So um, 
I, I don't know if people are heard, but I wear two hats. <laughs> wear my company hat and I wear my Apache hat. So sometimes people get confused of where, which one, which hat I'm wearing. So uh, my Apache hat. Keep at it. Good work so far, but keep going. As a developer, I was never really super excited about Docker containers, VMs, stuff like that. Never really made my job as a developer easier. This does. Very cool. Thank you. If you can only find a way to turn those users into committers, I, I think you'll have no problem at all. Awesome. Thanks so much. And now last, but definitely not least, traffic control. So Mark, take it away. All right, all right, thank you. I, I'm Mark Torlumke. I'm here to talk about traffic control. Uh, your, your first question is, is no doubt, what is, what is traffic control? <coughs> and then the answer to that is, it's a CDN control plane. Open source, of course, we're, we're in the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, your second question is probably, what is a CDN control plane? Uh, the answer to that is is uh, every th the set of software or everything that is that is needed besides a caching proxy or besides a cache to build a CDN. CDN can still have several different meanings or several different versions depending on who you are and what your specific use cases are. Uh, traffic control and and a cache like traffic server uh, makes up a, a, a classic CDN like uh, Akamai, Level Three, Limelight, CloudFront, CloudFlare. Um, so yes, using using a, a cache, using traffic server and traffic control, you can, you can build a CDN, a world-class CDN actually, uh, that, that rivals um, some of these vendors that you can buy a CDN as a service from. Uh, this is the, the obligatory up and to the right graph, number one. Um, this shows the total internet traffic to delivered in a month. Um, this, uh, this graph ends in 2014, but the, the trend has certainly, continues, has certainly continued. Um, and, and CDNs are, are really the technology that enable the, the, this traffic to, to keep growing. You know, as we, uh, as we push, if we push media, we push content closer and closer to the user. Um, we, we don't have to uh, infinitely scale our, our backbone networks. This is obligatory up into the right graph number two. Um, the, um, the, the green line is, is an average hour. Uh, the blue line is a busy hour. And you know, certainly as we, as we consume more and more media, um, the, the, the focus on, on the content um, per user be, becomes a lot higher. And, and again, the, 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 needs for, the need for CDN accelerates. Uh, a, quick, a quick history of traffic control and, and the work on it. January 2012, we started this in, in Comcast. Uh, nine months later, we did our first uh, production deployment. It was, it was very beta-y, but we had got the job done. Uh, two and a half years later, we we cleaned up the code. We uh, wrote a lot of amazing documentation, and we got all the legal approvals to uh, to open source it, which was uh, was a really big step for Comcast. Um, and then um, a year and some change later, we were accepted into the Apache Incubator. And then February of this year, we we got our first release through. Thanks JDA. Thanks Justin. Others. Um, back to the project a little bit. We don't, we don't have a ton of time, but um, you know, potentially we can have a hallway conversation or something about these things. We, we see a CDN as having these uh, five components. We've, we've lifted out caches a little bit because, uh, again, those are typically separate projects. Um, but we have the, the other four pieces. We have software. We have what we sort of consider to be top-level components uh, to cover the, the other four pieces um, between analytics, configuration, management, a health protocol, and a, and a content router, a traffic router. And um, a, quick, a quick note about the, the breakdown of the code in the repo. You know, I, think it's, I think it's a little bit important to, um, to, to highlight the, the languages that, that we use. Um, you know, we certainly have a good chunk of, of web E sort of languages. Um, we have a good chunk of Perl, as any good CDN control plane does. Um, we have, uh, we of course, we, we run a, a, a massive, highly concurrent CDN. So we have, we have a good chunk of Go, and, and Java is also um, is sort of our, our workhorse on, on, on a lot of stuff. Um, but, but also, do, do, not be, do, not be, uh, do not be afraid of our documentation, or do not be afraid of the investment we've made in our documentation. You know, 22,000 lines of, of, of RST files is, is certainly nothing to, um, 
um, to, to be frowned in face. Anyway, 200 lines, 200,000 lines of, of stuff um, for reference traffic server. You know, the traffic server w in which we wrap is, is around 500,000 lines of, of C and C++. Um, find us, find us on Slack. We, we, we feel like we're, we're very good about, uh, about bringing new, uh, new community members into, into our ecosystem. Um, if you're, if you're beginning, if you want to just get traffic control up and going, you will probably have a set of questions and, and typically Slack is, is the place to find us. We're, we're, we're typically very reli reliable and, um, and helpful there. Uh, however, if you have, if we have design discussions, if you want to, if you want to, uh, if you want to talk about roadmap, any of those things, they must happen on the mailing list. If it doesn't happen on the mailing list, it doesn't happen. Uh, we know that. Um, and a quick, one quick, a couple of quick notes about uh, about the activity of the project. Um, this is the number of commits per week for every Apache repo over the last six months, uh, and the the orange line is traffic control. Um, find me later if you want some of the details here. And and yes, the the, the minute folks were 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 thirteenth on this total list. Um, taking summing the the area under those curves or summing all of those commits again under the under the, over the last six months um, puts us uh, like fifteenth, uh, I think. Which which you know we we totally understand uh, commits is not is not a way to measure how active your project is, and and in fact it it really. Highlights one of our uh, one of our struggles, which is we we have we have lots of people, we have lots of interest in solving our technical problems, um, but we don't have a lot of interest. We don't have a lot of interest so far in solving our non-technical problems, you know, independence, community involvement, um, uh, th things things like that. Um, so said another way, th those are those are the hard problems for us. So the easy problems we feel like are are the technology. Um, and, and again, we, we understand c commits is not is not really th that accurate of a measure. Um, and that is um, that is all I have. Good questions and thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I guess this time we'll start with Jim because he also has a little bit to do with something that's received in that traffic. Yeah, uh, there seems to be a a tight um, almost dependency. Uh, on Apache traffic server. I was just wondering uh, basically two things. Um, are the hooks and scars in there enough that you can use basically almost anything as a cache? Uh, that's question number one. And question number two is how much cross-pollination have you seen between traffic control and traffic server as far as commits and things like that or contributions? Two fantastic questions. Um, the, the the tight coupling with with traffic uh, traffic server um, is is obvious. We would first we would love to support a number of caches. You know certainly the, there's a, there's a lot um, the, there is a lot of efforts or there's a lot of engagement with nginx, varnish, um, some of the other some of the other caching proxies. Um, you know we've we we always um, we, we always keep that in mind when, when we make decisions. You know it's always it's always top of mind to us. You know if you look at our logo, uh, we we didn't want to copy the traffic server logo because we didn't we didn't want that tight coupling. If you look at our our, our, a lot of our diagrams, our documentation, those things that they, they, they are not, they're not similar. We did not model after traffic service. So, um, our, our heart is there. It's always top of mind. Um, we just haven't gotten there yet. Um, the second question. Um, what was the second question? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, an, another great question. Another, another thing that's, that's very much top of mind. Um, the Sunday and Monday this week, Mother's Day and, and Monday this week, we had, we had a two-day summit uh, right next door to the traffic server folks. Um, and and it was it was good. A, a lot of the traffic control folks were, were able to spend an hour or or so in the sessions for traffic server. And certainly the the other way around happened. Um, happened a sufficient amount. You know, getting some nods. Yeah. You know, it's um, it, it's uh, it's it's top of minds. It's um, th these are big systems that we're building. They're, they they do take some efforts. Um, uh, but I, I think I think our, our heart is there. So uh, why should I use this CDN over some of the others you, you just mentioned? Right. Yeah. CDN. Yeah. Why? Why? Why DIY versus when you, you can you can uh, fairly economically buy it from a vendor? That that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, if you're if you're building if you're building uh if you're building a, if you work for a large enterprise or if you have a large enterprise such as Apache, um, uh, we, we, we think it's worth it. You know, you, you always need to run the numbers, which, you know, which way is, is our investment in the, the people, 
<coughs> and uh, you know the documentation, the monitoring, potentially uh, worth it versus uh, you know just writing a check. Um, I don't know, folks, um, other traffic control folks, do you have anything else to add there? I think we're driving the prices down. We're actually commoditizing wow. CDNs, and we're driving those guys' exactly. prices down. So thanks, thanks for coming. There we go. <laughs> So why Apache? How, why did you guys come here? You've been in existence for a while. What made you come to us? And how are you going to expand your group? Um, yeah, I'll probably lean on Jan again for this one. Um, you know, a Yeah, uh, Apache has a lot of good facilities for for teaching us the, the the right way to do to do open source, and we're 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 learning a lot. We're, we're leveraging those facilities. Yep. I love to see it when uh, one ASF project is able to like uh, incubate or create a space for other open source projects. Fantastic. Uh, CDNs are like mojo magic that people really don't appreciate as much as they should. So uh, kudos, fantastic. And I realized it was, must have been a major effort for Comcast to actually take this and open source it, and kudos to that as well. That's major. Thank you. What Jim said. <laughs> <laughs> so how far do you guys think that you'll be continuing on on the incubation path? Because we believe that there's a way to go, right? We, 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 do think it's, we do think it's a way to go. Um, like I said, we, we are learning a lot. Um, even though it's been, it's been almost nine months, we, we sort of feel like we're just getting started. Um, uh, again, our, our, our mentors are helpful. Certainly Justin, uh, JDA helpful on the, the, the IPMC. Um, I, I would be surprised if we graduated inside of, inside of the next year. But you know, maybe similar to, to, to my notes, the, a year from now is probably a good call. And that was it for today. So four amazing presentations, uh, three brilliant judges, and let's thank our judges once again. Thank you for coming. And thank you all for coming.